Joseph, welcome to the show. Thank you. Hi, Stefan. So, Joseph, I've been reading uh, some of your work on Bitcoin Magazine. You've been writing a little bit there. I know you're uh, over at Trezor as well. And you have a bit of a history in the Liberty and Austrian movements as well. So let's start there with uh, some of your history in the libertarian and Austro-libertarian world. All right. So for me, uh, the way the path to libertarianism was quite uh, straightforward because I was lucky enough to study at... Uh, the University of Economics in Prague at the Faculty of Economic Policy and that was at the time it was like 2009 till 2011 when the Faculty of Economics uh, or the Faculty of Economic Policy was heavily populated with Austrian economists. Uh, there was uh, Josef Schima, Professor Schima who uh, organized the translation of, Rod uh, of Mises' Human Action uh, of stuff from Friedman, Hayek, Rothbard, and he was like the head of the department there. So our textbook uh, on economics was actually Rothbard's Man, Economy and State. So we were heavily influenced uh, uh, with uh, Austrian economics and I fell in love with that. And after, after school, me and some of my uh, classmates founded the Czech Mises Institute, which was just a copy of the American one. At that time, a lot of uh, these local Mises Institutes uh, uh, sprang up around the world. And our idea was to continue with the work that uh, Liberal Institute in Czech Republic started with this, these publications of uh, stuff from Austrian economists. So we published uh, me, uh, stuff from Mises, Bastiat, uh, For a New Liberty from Rothbard. We organized a summer school for high school students and university students. And it was just a way for us to keep in touch with uh, Austrian school and libertarianism while we were working uh, like ordinary corporate jobs. I see. So it was like your side project as a way to sustain uh, education out there. And so where where is that nowadays? Well, um, I mentioned uh, Liberal Institute that was founded in 1989 in Prague. And around the time we founded the Mises Institute in 2010, the original institute uh, founded in 89 sort of uh, went into a coma because there were some internal struggles in the institute. And our Mises Institute then basically uh, took the job of uh, educating people in Austrian school and uh, libertarianism. and when the problems were settled in the Liberal Institute, when the internal struggle uh, sort of resolved itself, that was like 2016-17, we basically merged the two institutes because uh, like Czech Republic isn't so large that we need like multiple libertarian institutes. So we basically merged these two to together and uh, now it's still around in the form of Liberal Institute and we keep on publishing uh, like books that need to be published and we keep on having uh, the summer school and it's been like 12 years now uh, when we had the summer school and it produced some like very noteworthy Czech libertarians. And in the time that it was operating, what was the main way of funding here? Was it through donors or was it just through everyone in the organization just chipping in some money? Like how was, how was that organization sustaining itself? Yeah, so uh, the main contribution was our time. We did it as our hobby and uh, we didn't uh, get any like wage from that. So that was the m main contribution and we didn't have any offices actually. It was uh, it, uh, it also a website, a blog. Uh, we like published the books and the warehouse was like a, like a flat of uh, my friend uh, and we delivered the books by hand to a post office. So it was like, a, it had a really like a startup feel <laughs> for years. And uh, yeah, we had some, we had some donors, some private donors, uh, which really helped us in publishing the books and having like the basic capital for 
printing like a thousand books and then it sustained itself from from the sales of the books mostly yeah and then obviously being an austro libertarian that is a libertarian who comes from that austrian school of economics obviously you would have been very well primed when you came across bitcoin right was that so pre uh, presumably that was your connection that was how you came across bitcoin yeah that's right actually i heard like the first lecture or the first podcast on bitcoin i heard uh, in i believe 2011 that was econ talk russ roberts uh and then like the first lecture on bitcoin in czech uh, we had on our summer school in like 2012 and it didn't click for me back then we were like aware of uh, free banking of uh, the idea of controlling not of the state not controlling uh, our money supply and not defining the money uh, and it just clicked for me gradually in the like coming years in between 2012 2015 and yeah then basically uh, we the Czech Austral Austral libertarians became aware of uh, how the Austrian School of Economics is actually very compatible with the idea of Bitcoin and mostly like the idea of free banking because a lot of the Austrian economists uh, also have this view of uh, the government or the state shouldn't intervene in like private contracts of uh, citizens and their banks and the government shouldn't have like this uh, bureaucracy on top uh, in the form of central bank and uh, the free banking idea could be very well ported over to bitcoin and its ecosystem so that made sense for us yeah so for listeners who are new to bitcoin and maybe they don't really see as much of that connection between bitcoin and austrian economics what are some of the key ideas to understand there let's say somebody is new they're trying to listen and learn a bit about bitcoin what is that connection all right so one of my uh, all-time favorite articles in economics is hayek's the use of knowledge in society and hayek who was a part of this austrian tradition pointed out that uh, prices or the price system is like a knowledge sharing network where the prices communicate information about uh, relative scarcities that are only locally known and in order to have a sufficient uh, division of labor and to be able to cooperate uh, in like large complex society that we have today we need to share these locally known um, data and prices do this in the most elegant way just via a single number and it's very important over which medium this signal is communicated and if the medium itself isn't like neutral and uh, isn't uh, and is a subject to intervention intervention by uh, the government via price controls or by the central bank via issuance of credit then the signal gets polluted with noise so uh, for me and for a lot, lots of Austrians uh, the basic problem with money being controlled by the state is that uh, the price signals no longer work real well we have uh, investment bubbles we have misallocation of capital we have like the inflation tax in, a for in the form of Cantillon effect and we need to uh, repair the, this knowledge sharing network with having a proper medium for it which is money that is neutral uh, and this is like the most convincing case for me for Bitcoin from the Austrian point of view uh, because money pervades basically everything we do in a sufficiently complex society and we just need the proper medium for our prices to, co to convey the economic signals. Now with Hayek it is interesting because you might be able to argue that Hayek would have seen it more like oh there'd be lots of private competing currencies so in our modern day uh, 
online discussion, some have speculated that Hayek would have been a shitcoiner, right? Like he would have been like, oh, about all, about all the different coins and not really seeing this reason, this driving push towards there being one best one. I'm curious, what do you think about that? Yeah, uh, you probably, uh, you're probably pointing out his denationalization of yes, money, yeah. the book that he published towards the end of his life, when he actually uh, realized uh, his error because he was making the the error throughout his life where he considered money uh, as something that needs to be regulated by the state and he realized his error towards the end of his life but uh, yeah he argues for uh, competing banks to issue their own uh, currencies but he still considered gold as the underlying money uh, which is also why uh, like Bitcoiners don't always uh, describe Bitcoin as a currency or as a cryptocurrency because it's uh, more, it's better defined as money, as uh, something like gold used to be in the past. And sure, we can uh, we can issue some kind of currencies on top of it, and we could argue that uh, IOUs on exchanges are actually such currencies that maybe or maybe not uh, fully res fully backed uh, but the underlying medium uh, used to be gold Hayek argued for that as well as most Austrian uh, economists and Bitcoin is this underlying form of money nowadays yeah and so it is an interesting uh, point there around how uh, and I guess for listeners as well this is also a point of difference between let's say the full reserve uh, banking camp and let's say the Free, free banking camp because that might be a point of difference where let's say from the full reserve perspective they might say you, you shouldn't these banks or exchanges should not be fractioning fractionalizing the reserve beyond what they actually have and there's obviously in bitcoin as, as you're well aware joseph there's obviously this strong culture around self-custody of coins so from your point of view how do you do you square that circle or do you accept that let's say Hypothetically, there could be exchanges out there who are secretly fractionalizing their reserves. Well, uh, it all depends on uh, what the contract says. Like, uh, there are institutions that uh, lend out uh, Bitcoin that you Bitcoiners have deposited and they don't lie about it in their terms yeah. and condition they actually mention that it can be uh re-hypothecated ah. re-hypothecated right so as yeah. a, so i guess what you're saying is that essentially it's if they are open about it then from your point of view that's mm -hmm. not a problem so let's say there are yeah. providers out there who might be openly re-hypothecating and not hiding it so from your point of view it's still an issue if a bank or an exchange a bitcoin exchange in this case is lying about it, right? So if they were pretending, no, 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 we're full reserve, we have all the coins we say we do, but actually they don't. And they've been issuing out more IOU claims to their customers, and unfortunately those customers are the ones who are getting screwed over in that case because they think they've got a claim to quote-unquote real Bitcoin that you can claim on-chain, but actually they don't. Yeah, that's, that's the issue. And uh, when we actually look into the debate of the free bankers, uh, in terms of like how uh, free banking in gold should be managed uh, or the banking system uh, under the gold standard should be managed. So what uh, people like uh, Jesus Huerta de Soto, Larry White, George Selgin, Larry Seacrest, what they actually point out is uh, there isn't a problem with like time deposits. If you like lend out your money to the bank and they promise to uh, return your deposit uh, in some time period, like after 12 months, that's not a problem because uh, the expectations of both sides are aligned. The problem is with uh, like uh, current deposits where if you deposit your money into a bank, the bank can lend it out and still promises you to uh, pay your deposit or to uh, your ability to withdraw from the bank anytime you wish that uh, doesn't really make sense and it's kind of sketchy so uh, like the full reserve uh, the 100% reserve argument 
is that if you don't have this time alignment between the uh, creditors and borrowers uh, something sketchy is going on and uh, Jesus Huerta de Soto actually wrote uh, uh, it's how is it called uh, money like bank credit and economic and cycles yeah money bank credit and economic cycles which is like uh, most of it is basically like a legal argument it's not really economic uh, he borrows a lot of like legal arguments and makes the case for why uh, fractional reserve banking, where there is this time mismatch, uh, is a type of fraud, basically, because uh, the, these promises cannot be fulfilled. So, at the end of the day, then it remains. It, yeah, so it remains to be seen what way the ecosystem goes. But we are seeing things like proof of reserves being put out there. So, Kraken, obviously one of the world's well-known U.S. exchanges, past sponsor of my show recently did put out a proof of reserves uh, audit and I think they got a, a firm, I think it was Armanino, who did an audit and basically customers of Kraken could now check the reserves. So that's an interesting technology that in some ways now is possible with Bitcoin and so maybe Bitcoin actually changes that debate somewhat. Yeah, that could be possible and uh, we probably need to settle this uh, before Bitcoin actually develops any sufficient credit market because nowadays nobody basically takes uh, loans in Bitcoin and uh, so the exchanges aren't faced with like the decision uh, how to match like the borrowers and uh, creditors because if somebody borrows Bitcoin nowadays it's just for shorting Bitcoin it's not for taking a taking it out of the institution and investing it it's in some project like like the usual stuff with the banking sector so uh, yeah if we uh, like uh, normalize proof of reserves and this idea that uh, all the liabilities should be matched with deposits uh, before this credit uh, market develops that will be great that's like then the whole uh, argument about full reserve versus fractional reserve would be settled. It's easy to settle with Bitcoin, with uh, the proof of reserves. And yeah, I, I believe that like uh, Jesus worked at the Soto's point about uh, the fractional reserve being a sor sort of fraud is quite right. And uh, we will run into problems if we try to like reconstruct the credit market with fractional reserve principles. Yeah, very interesting. And it's a good point that I, you know, nowadays, basically, it's not a thing that people are directly borrowing Bitcoin. Really, what's going on is it's typically somebody is putting up Bitcoin as collateral and they're borrowing fiat against it. Or in some cases, yes, uh, you know, there are there have been instances where, let's say, there were Bitcoin banks or exchange providers who would loan Bitcoin out to, let's say, a trading firm and they're playing this arbitrage game where they can... Uh, they actually do need to borrow some Bitcoin and they might be shorting or they might be doing some other uh, activity that requires them to be able to quickly access this Bitcoin liquidity. Uh, but it it sort of, it does come back to that idea of what does the market really want? And if the market over time shows, hey, we want proof of reserve, we want full reserve, then, you know, that that's one side. Now, the other side, now, personally, I'm more in the full reserve side myself, of course, but just... Out of curiosity, let's say there are exchanges out there doing fractional reserve and so on. I guess the question that might be interesting is, will businesses who participate in, let's say, the fractional reserved economy of Bitcoin in that hypothetical world, would they be suspect to, let's say, the business cycle theory or you know, that expansion of credit beyond the amount of voluntary saving? I think that's probably an interesting question. If, if on one side you've got this fully reserved side and on the other side you've got this fractional reserved economy in a bitcoin economy world how do you see that playing out like would you see these businesses on the full reserve side being lacking in competitive competitiveness versus the fractional side because they can access more resources or do you think it's actually the other argument would be maybe that side is not sustainable without a central bank to be able to bail out the fractional reserve um side companies mm -hmm. who didn't uh who weren't careful enough let's say yeah it's uh, probably tough to predict but the case would be 
that the fractional reserve institutions would uh, basically be able to offer lower interest rates. So that might be tempting for mm, the business entrepreneurs and investors, yeah, yeah, to take credit there. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I don't know what the like deposit interest rate would be. It would probably be lower as well, so it wouldn't be as uh, interesting to the depositors. Uh, and yeah, like the first uh, bank run on such an institution would probably be a wake up call because, as you say, there are no bailouts in Bitcoin. So uh, yeah, like there will be a liquidity crisis. There could be like uh, you know, bank runs under Bitcoin, like Bitcoin banks sort of uh, world. Uh, but uh, the the amount of uh, like errors would not accumulate. There will be no bailouts, so uh, it would be impossible to bail out uh, the too big to fail like banks and corporations from uh, one recession to the next, and we wouldn't have this huge like credit bubble in front of us. And uh, yeah, like uh, those who made the mistakes would pay for it which is yeah. as it should be. So the mistakes wouldn't uh, grow, grow so large. Yeah, that's an interesting point to make because essentially you're saying, and the argument here is that those irresponsible lenders, let's say the irrespo- like let's say we, those fractional reserve lenders, more irresponsible ones would be the ones who go out of business because there are no bailouts, because there is no central yeah. bank lender of last resort guaranteeing them like there is today in the fiat world with the Federal Reserve and the central banks around the world. So that is an interesting point of difference. I... Yeah, I, I, I still, I still believe it's going to tip towards the full reserve side, but we have to wait and see what the market chooses. I think. Um, so. Yeah, sure. Uh, and <clears throat> as I pointed out, like uh, we can have sort of like a, I don't know if it's even called fractional reserve, but if the expectations between the borrowers and lenders are matched in time, uh, whereas I lend out my money for a fixed time period, that's okay. Like uh, the, the institution can, of course, like lend it out to them. And uh, there shouldn't be, pr- this doesn't lead to a risk of bank run because I cannot, uh, I cannot redeem my deposit before it's due. So uh, this is probably how, uh, how the ecosystem will develop. Like there will be more time deposits and less of like this risky fractional reserve lending. I'm also curious, w- while we're here, the difference in, let's say, borrowing and debt culture might be very different. Like, let's say it moves into a fully full reserve world. The way I'm seeing it is it's really going to be massively more of an equity-driven world as opposed to debt-driven because you would own a stake in things as opposed to borrowing because, borrow- like, hypothetically, the interest rates would just be so high to borrow uh, that it's just going to change the way things operate. But let's say we lived in that hypothetical Bitcoin fractionalized world where let's say there's a bunch of openly rehypothecating banks or Bitcoin exchanges, whatever you want to call them. What do you believe? Do you believe that credit market would look a little closer to to today than compared to, let's say, that hypothetical equity world? Yeah, credit market would probably deflate a lot, like uh, the amount of uh, issued debt would be much lower. And on the other hand, uh, like it will be probably closer to uh, what is called like Islamic banking today, where uh, if you want to invest into some venture, you don't actually lend out money, you just uh, buy a portion of the equity. Uh, So uh, like direct equity investment would probably take precedence over credit. Uh, And uh, like this may sound harsh for example like for individuals the biggest uh, loan we undertake in our life is usually mortgage and it's uh, mm, like to say that we would have to uh, save up for our houses uh, nowadays that's crazy because uh, the houses costs like uh, 10 or 20 years worth of our wage 
and uh, but the problem is mm, the real estate market is heavily inflated with the country loan effect and all the new money being issued and uh, most of it or a lot of it is flowing into real estate so uh, we could be able to save up for our housing in a span of like a few few years if our m like money's purchasing power didn't evaporate so fast and if uh, there was there wasn't this uh, huge uh, uh, like credit expansion that flows into real estate markets so that the prices would fall. So these two effects combined, higher purchasing power over time and lower inflation of the assets would lead to like uh, big purchases for individuals and investments as well to be more uh, approachable, to be more accessible for people and businesses. So yeah, we cannot uh, function otherwise nowadays uh, than just going into credit, but it will basically uh, flip over under like a sound money standard where <coughs> uh, it would make more sense to wait a few years, save up and then invest or buy some housing. Yeah, that's and as you're saying, the price of housing has gone ridiculous. And so because of the multiple of the annual salary of the average person or the median person, it's just out of reach for a lot of people without taking on credit. And it it's interesting that people want bull markets in property or or they want they want housing to be affordable, but they don't want their own houses to be affordable, right? They want their own house to keep going up in yeah. value. And so it's like, where is this going to end? Of course, I think as the world adopts a Bitcoin standard, the relative valuations of property, house pro housing and things will have to come down. I think it'll just have to normalize, but there will be a lot of people who are not happy about that because like we said, they want housing to be affordable in general. They like the idea, but when if, if you ask someone, do you want your house to become more affordable that you already own? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, the problem with like misallocation of capital. And we had so much of it in the past 50 years or maybe even 100 years that, uh, uh, like we cannot, uh, uh, there is no way around economic laws and in the end uh, like all debts have to be paid and the capital that was misallocated needs to be uh, properly allocated in the end. So uh, yeah, like uh, the path itself to like hyper Bitcoinization is going to be painful for lots of sectors, a lot of people because uh, we don't have a proper store of value right now that would be neutral, neutral that wouldn't uh, be subject to some jurisdiction uh, that wouldn't uh, necessarily be a recipient of like the Campylon effect. And as we discover such a neutral store of value instrument in the form of Bitcoin, and as the capital sort of flows back because we had this uh, throughout history in the form of gold and silver. And uh, like right now we are in the intermission, in the monetary intermission uh, with this crazy experiment of fiat money. So as the capital flows back and people discover, like rediscover the store of value in form of sound money, that's going to be painful for a lot of people who, uh, who didn't get the message and who ignore this. And if you think about the typical balance sheet of a lot of current banks, their assets are these mortgages. And these mortgages are denominated in fiat terms. And so they could really be in a lot of trouble if they don't go out and buy a Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah. And um, that's like a situation it's very hard to get out of, especially if you're a regulated financial institution because you <laughs> you usually cannot invest in Bitcoin or stuff like that. You are forced to hold uh, like government bonds to hold these mortgages and you just have to uh, sit on this sinking ship without like uh, having any lifeboat to jump into. So uh, yeah, that's a very tough spot. And it seems like the central banks are sort of realizing that the banking sector is sort of doomed. And you have probably seen uh, the proposals to have CBDC that basically circumvents the banking sector, where 
like the commercial banks are basically no longer needed so <laughs> like it's uh, it's crazy being in these banks even understanding what's going on and there are like uh, uh, banks like uh, Saxo Bank I believe where they sometimes issue like high quality analysis even uh, concerning Bitcoin and I I'm I really don't know like what's what's the what's the exit plan there like how can they save themselves well I guess the longer term plan is that uh, they they will have to be fire sold and someone's going to be buying them and recapitalizing the mm. banks and resetting them up in a new way in a Bitcoin uh, friendly way let's say um, now you mentioned um, economic laws earlier and one of your articles you wrote about this idea of Nakamoto Gresham's law so I guess before we get into that do you want to first explain for people what is Gresham's law sure it's uh, actually one of the oldest economic insights uh, by Thomas Gresham in like 16th century and he uh, witnessed how like uh, the co-circulation of two types of money uh, what sort of dynamic it produces. So uh, Gresham uh, said like uh, bad coin and good coin cannot uh, circulate together and the Gresham's law is usually stated as bad money drives out good meaning, meaning that people prefer to spend this bad money first and hold on to uh, the good money for long term. And uh, this doesn't actually tell us that much, like what is bad money, what is good money, and what does it mean that it drives out uh, the other type of money. So I like uh, Murray Rothbard's definition, who restated Gresham's insight as uh, money overvalued by government drives out of circulation manner, money undervalued by government. And uh, usually, Gresham's law is applic uh, f applied to the bimetallism era in the United States throughout 19th century, where uh, the, the government uh, basically fixed the ratio between the two metals, between gold and silver, so that the ratio was 15 to 1, 15 uh, silver ounces to 1 gold ounce. But the problem was uh, the market ratio between these two metals uh, deviated from the official government definition. So one of these metals was always undervalued uh, in the form of coins uh, when compared to the other metal. So when silver was undervalued, uh, gold was used as the medium of exchange and silver was uh, driven out of circulation, meaning it was used as a store of value. And yeah, so should I go on with yeah. the Nakamoto Gresham's law? Right, so I, I guess one clarification there is that it's, I think Rothbard wrote about Gresham's law being, and explaining it like it's actually just a specialized instance of the general problem with price controls. And so what happens is if the government puts the price controls in, puts price controls in place, and those, especially if those price controls aren't reflective of the market reality around that, then what happens uh, to think one way to think about it is people just decide well it's better for me to hold this one and spend that one because this one th the government has mandated that merchants accept this gold or silver at this specific exchange ratio which is out of whack is out of price and so they they decide to hold the one obviously keeping more value for themselves uh so could you just explain a little bit about this nakamoto gresham's law yeah, yeah, and thank you for that point. It's a good insight that uh, it's actually an instance of price control where you have surpluses on one side and shortages on the other. So the Nakamoto Gresham's law, uh, I, I was thinking about how Gresham's law is actually applicable to Bitcoin and Bitcoiners sometimes invoke this Gresham's law to uh, describe like the relationship between fiat and Bitcoin. But the problem is uh, the original Gresham's law uh, only works if the government sets the ratio between the cur two currencies. And uh, the state today 
it basically regulates the value of fiat, but it doesn't regulate the value of Bitcoin. So we have like state money on one side and the non-state money on the other side. So Gresham's law isn't really applicable, but we can sort of salvage uh, Gresham's law and it's useful inside if we drop like the uh, condition that uh, the government has to set the ratio between the two types of money. And instead we look into uh, how the monetary policy, policy, the issuance schedule of the two types of monies play out in the future and what's the expectation on the future value. And we know that fiat is basically, it has no limit in issuance. Uh, the central bank along with the banking sector can issue as much dollars as possible. We have central bankers saying that uh, on air actually. And when we consult like the uh, M2 money aggregator, we can see it's actually exponential. Uh, there's more and more dollars in issuance. And we also know that Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin's monetary policy is uh, <coughs> actually quite the, quite the opposite. It's flattening over long term and there will be just 21 million. It is a fixed schedule. So uh, when we sort of uh, take this into account, uh, we can say that fiat is going to decrease in value forever. Uh, that's just the nature of fiat's monetary policy. And we can also say that Bitcoin is going to increase in value forever, especially in terms of fiat currencies. So uh, the Nakamoto Gresham law then says that Bitcoin drives out fiat as a store of value and fiat in turn drives out Bitcoin as a medium of exchange because if we still have some fiat to spend, we want to spend this first. And if you have an excess to Bitcoin, we want to save in Bitcoin. And it doesn't make sense to do it otherwise if we have both of these types of monies. It just makes sense to spend fiat and huddle Bitcoin. So that's like an economic explanation why huddling Bitcoin is very rational and uh, we don't have to actually come up with any new insights, just uh, use the insights we already have and uh, accommodate it to this dynamic of state and non-state money. Yes, yeah, so holding Bitcoin is rational. So that's, uh, that's out there for everyone to think about. And so you also mentioned that there are some preconditions to this. So uh, what are those preconditions to make this viable or to make this true? Oh, yeah, sure. So <coughs> I uh, I came up with two conditions for the Nakamoto Gresham's law. And first one that we still uh, have to earn some fiat and still have some fiat to spend. Because if we only earn Bitcoin, then of course, Bitcoin becomes the medium of exchange as well, because we have to pay for our rent and food and such. And the other one is that fiat is still usable for our transactions. Uh, because it could be the case that I'm making uh, some wage in fiat terms, but I c cannot actually purchase stuff that I need uh, to buy. Uh, like if, <coughs> if I'm in some developing country and I need to do some cross-border transactions and the banking system isn't there or uh, it's sanctioned or stuff like that, then I have to use Bitcoin. So the two conditions is I still have to earn some fiat and the, the other one is fiat still works as a medium of exchange uh, to satisfy my needs which is not the case for some bitcoiners and for some countries so um, spending bitcoin is actually rational as well if you do not meet these two conditions if uh, your earnings are just in bitcoin and if for example you're in venezuela and you cannot buy uh, like drugs uh, in term, uh, like medical drugs uh, from abroad and you need to find uh, uh, a means of exchange uh, that facilitate that and that's uh, that could be bitcoin i see and so essentially yeah as you're saying basically for people who still have fiat income and they can still spend fiat income well then okay it's it, it still applies but let's say somebody is all in Bitcoin and they only earn Bitcoin, well then obviously they're going to have to spend <laughs> spend some. 
Um, but these are only yeah. uh, these are a small number of people. Uh, but of course, it that even that number of people is growing over time, and it still contributes to that overall network effect. Being able to spend Bitcoin, um, but I think the important part is, as you're saying, is how many people are hodling Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like I get the argument with the need to build up circular economies, but. Uh, that's more like an ideological argument like uh, I am happy to spend Bitcoin with a merchant uh, uh, as a way of support if I know the merchant is going to hold on to Bitcoin but uh, I don't do it because uh, uh, it's more convenient, convenient for me or more comfortable or anything because uh, like payment systems in Czech Republic are heavily advanced we have like a credit and debit cards we have uh, nfc payments apple pay and stuff and that's very comfortable so um, i don't need another paypal i don't need other another like a uh, fast medium of exchange because we have instant uh, instant transfers here uh, what i need is a proper predictable store of value for like long-term preservation of my purchasing power so the economic uh, incentive for me is to hold on to bitcoin and spend fiat and sure there could be like an ideological case of uh, spending bitcoin but it's not economic it's not uh, like uh, based in economics great and so in your view then is it a problem that bitcoin is not widely used directly as medium of exchange well uh, it's used as a medium of exchange where it makes sense, Uh, like for the cross-border payments, uh, for payments where I need an increased uh, level of privacy and I'm actually able to like use Bitcoin in a private manner, Uh, for uh, like recently in Canada, we saw that uh, fiat can actually uh, be become quite useless as a a medium of exchange if your accounts are frozen. So in that in that instance, it makes sense to use Bitcoin because you cannot use anything else. Uh, but usually, even in those cases, uh, if you still have some cash, then cash is the king because it's very private. Uh, it's basically censorship resistant, but you have to be able to physically hand it over. Uh, so Bitcoin as a medium of exchange makes sense when, uh, when it has some benefit over spending fiat. It could be privacy, censorship resistance. Uh, f- and like we are not going to increase the adoption of Bitcoin and we are not going to uh, arrive at hyper-Bitcoinization with like altruistic payments. We need the economic incentives to work. And the economic incentives right now in the Western countries, at least, lead us to hodling Bitcoin and spending fiat. Especially in the case where there are capital gains taxes involved. Uh, But in some countries, they don't have capital gains taxes or in some certain situations, it might make sense. So an interesting one to see where that develops. Uh, Also wanted to get your thoughts. I know you're a treasurer, of course, and uh, you also wrote a little bit about Taproot and hardware wallets. So can you just give an overview? What kind of benefits do you see coming with Taproot for hardware wallet users? Sure. So the main benefit for Trezor and for hardware wallets in general is Taproot makes uh, CoinJoin uh, practical. Uh, it was possible to like construct these coin joint transactions before with hardware wallets but uh, they would have to be very small in size so it, it wouldn't help that much with privacy and with taproot uh, due to like uh, technical obstacles of like uh, legacy transactions uh, it was impossible to construct these uh, coin joint transactions and with taproot it becomes possible and practical so uh, we in Trezor are working uh, on the CoinJoin implementation. It's going to be based on the Wabi Sabi protocol. Uh, and uh, throughout this year, we should introduce uh, this in our Trezor suite, which is the accompanying app for Trezor. And that's, that's, the, main, uh, that's the main benefit of Taproot in hardware wallets for now. 
and in the future uh, the benefits would be uh, the being like having the ability to uh, like let me mention one other thing uh, the other good benefit is uh, of course any kind of multi-signature uh, transactions which become cheaper and more private uh, but in case like people don't uh, perform these transactions then like the most interesting benefit will be uh, opening up and closing and managing lightning network channels because these transactions are multi-sig as well so these will become cheaper and more private as well yeah so there may be also a fee saving as well for the uh, taproot um, transactions and hopefully it will make coin joins uh, a little bit cheaper in the future with especially with the ag the uh, cross input signature aggregation so listeners can check out the earlier episode i did uh it was a tabconf episode with some bitcoin core developers so that one's called bitcoin on chain scaling so listeners who are interested in that you can check that episode um so yeah so uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens um with the developments around hardware wallets and what's coming with uh taproot now the taproot has been activated uh, do you see it being similar to how SegWit took a long time to get activated across the ecosystem, or do you see actually this time it'll be a bit faster or a bit better? Yeah, uh, it should be a bit faster because from like a technological standpoint, it's not that hard to implement the proof if you already implemented SegWit. And on the other hand, uh, with SegWit, we had a uh, lightning network in line and uh, we know that segwit was activated in summer 2017 and uh, the first lightning network transactions were live in uh, spring 2011 uh, 2018 if i'm not mistaken so that was quite a short uh, time period in between uh, and hopefully coinjoin and hardware wallets will mm, provide the same incentive for the ecosystem to adopt the route uh, uh, faster because we need the use case we need uh, like uh, the incentive to actually implement it and use it right now there's not that many use cases it could be multi-six uh, but coin joints are probably going to be the major major reason for implementing and actually using the route such as lightning so was, uh, also the on the multi-signature aspect with taproot there is the music 2 um, protocol and uh, this is obviously still being worked on by some of the guys like tim ruffing and jonas nick um, is there any thought there around what that might look like from a hardware wallets point of view like would a hardware wallets implement that or, or is it i mean obviously it's still early days but is that something uh being looked at on the on the development track uh not to my knowledge and i will have to disappoint you here because i'm not really familiar with uh, m music as such uh, what i'm kind of excited about is uh, as you mentioned before uh cross input signature ag aggregation but that's it would require another software away because it <laughs> requires like a f yeah another soft fork so that's that's really interesting and then like l2 for lightning network improvements and I'm really not sure if that's possible to oh, do. Oh, yeah, so it would basically require either well. any prev out or I believe uh, CTV might also be able to enable something similar. But And there might be, I think the developers are chatting about mm -hmm. some other ways, but I think basically any prev out is the main one uh, before we could get L2. So we'll have to see about that one. Um, for listeners interested in any prev out, check out episode 200. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I guess, so those are probably the key questions I had. So I guess summarizing, like, there's been a bunch of chat about Austrian economics and fractional uh, reserve banking and full reserve banking and how that will apply into a Bitcoin world and what it might look like credit and de debt-wise uh, in that world. Uh, and then we've spoken a little bit about Gresham's Law and the Nakamoto Gresham's Law and how it's rational to hodl Bitcoin uh, do you have any thoughts you want to leave listeners with and uh, where can people find you online? Yeah, uh, for me it's always important uh, and I always remind people to basically zoom out especially if anything's happening to the price uh, because like uh, every dip becomes uh, very shallow with sufficient zoom 
Uh, so zoom out, uh, learn about why Bitcoin matters, why there's a good case to be made that it's actually uh, global non-state money and why it makes sense to, like as Satoshi said, get some in case it takes off and it seems like it's taking off quite well. And sure, um, I'm at uh, I am on Twitter as at uh, Sats Joseph. I write for Bitcoin Magazine. You can find my uh, Bitcoin Magazine articles under my name, Josef Tietek. And uh, yeah, I was really happy to be here and hope I'll meet you in Prague or Miami or on some of these conferences. Yeah, I hope to see you there. Thanks very much, Joseph. Thank you.